uh, and our sons. We have two sons, Tim and Paul, uh, ages 27 and 25. And it is remarkable, uh, and I mean this, it's remarkable to look out in this room and to see exponentially how Providence has grown uh, the summer gathering. It is, it's, uh, it's exceptional to see. You know, uh, when I first spoke to Young America's Foundation uh, in that first summer, uh, I remember saying to, uh, to the group that um, it's easy to become preoccupied by the issues of the day. I was looking at the lineup of speakers that you have. I was looking at the lineup of content and substance. I mean, they're really, as, as conservatives, there is no single venue better uh, than this venue. And I really do mean that. Uh, the sheer number of issues that you've heard about and that you're going to be hearing about, foreign and security policy, immigration, taxes, regulation. I, I really could go on and on. And, and I thought to myself, going back to the first set of remarks uh, more than 20 years ago, what is the narrative that I can bring to all of these terrific young people, the future leaders of our great nation? By the way, this is the greatest country in the history of man. And I don't mind saying, and I don't mind saying that I've had a love affair with America since I can remember. What is the message across all of this content and substance, across all of the issues of the day? What is the narrative that is most worthy? of those of us who are honored to call ourselves conservatives, what is the most important thing? Is it the size and scope of the federal government? Is it our southern border? Is it the issue of human life? Is it the issue of tax increases or tax cuts? Et cetera, et cetera. And when I really survey the most important the most important thing, it is the following. And if you forget everything that I've said, and you probably will, if you forget everything that we've shared together today, I'm raising my right hand. I actually actively pray that you will remember the following, and it is this. It is that whether you spend your life in and around the Beltway as I have, uh, 10 years working as a press secretary in the US Senate for Dan Coats, uh, eight years at the White House for George W. Bush, in January, 15 years as one of the vice presidents at Focus on the Family, uh, all living and working inside the swamp. And I promise you, I've only become more conservative, not less. When I, re, when I really look at all of those years and all of those things, internalize the larger American experience, what is the most important thing? It is that character is destiny. It is that your integrity is the coin of the realm. And whether you spend your life in Sacramento or Harrisburg, whether you spend your life in Gotham or Washington, DC, whether you spend your life in the tiniest, smallest town or village in our great country, or you spend your life in the largest metropolitan area, the one thing I've come to share with you this morning is that as conservatives, your character and your integrity will categorically set the foundation for your life. I'm not going to go into the details this morning, but I have learned the hard way the toxicity of pride and of arrogance. I've learned the hard way 
that ultimately all things, all is a big word, by the way. It's like the word never, right? I've learned that all things that are built on deception, lies, and half-truths, all things, they all eventually collapse, both in personal life and in the public square and the life of our nation. And hand over heart, it is the single reason that I find it the greatest professional honor of a lifetime to be associated with and to work with ministries like Focus on the Family, where we are preoccupied by marriage, family, parenting, human life, religious liberty, the pronoun battle, and with places like Young America's Foundation. And I want to begin my time with you by taking a step back, if I may. You know, in our founding era, no overstatements. These are facts. You know, Pat Moynihan once said that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not everyone's entitled to his own facts. John Adams, our second president, said facts are stubborn things. Yes, they are. Our founding fathers and mothers, it is a fact. They disagreed in real time on the biggest things that there could ever be. Don't take my word for it, by the way. I know who I'm speaking to this morning. You all read American history. You read the diaries and the entries and the letters. It's remarkable to go back into the American founding, even the pre-founding, and to read about what these men and women were actually discussing, what was top of mind, what motivated them to establish a constitutional republic like ours. I want to state for the record that our founding fathers and mothers disagreed on the biggest things that it is humanly possible to disagree about. You know, many of them believe that we should never have a standing military. And others believed that every state should have a fully armed militia. Our founding fathers and mothers disagreed about whether we should have a national currency. Some said there should be 13 forms of money, and some said, no, 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 we need to have a treasury, one American currency. Several of our founding fathers and framers believe very uh, firmly that ipso facto, if a state wanted to opt out of the United States, they should be able to opt out fairly easily, actually. And others, as early as 1776, asserted just the opposite, that we were becoming and would become one nation. These are very big things to disagree about. I could name a host of others. But I want to focus this morning on the single thing that our founding fathers and mothers, the first generation, formally as Americans, I want to focus on the one thing that they did not disagree about. They were preoccupied with ancient Rome. Now, that sounds a little strange. But I promise you, they were preoccupied by a moment in Western history where it ceased being the Roman Republic and became the Roman Empire. I mean, incrementally, this ancient republic, which fostered liberty, ceased to think of its people as citizens and began labeling them subjects. The great Roman Senate one of the greatest institutions for freedom in the history of Western civilization, ceased its power 
as a catalyst of liberty, and of course, altogether, the Roman Republic evaporated and became the Roman Empire. There was the rise of the Caesars, the forerunner to czars. What I'm suggesting this morning is that freedom is a very fragile thing. And there is no moment ever, even in a great nation like ours, where we are the greatest country for freedom and liberty now and shall always be. And the larger historical question is why, why? This is where our founding fathers and mothers were preoccupied. Why did it cease being a republic and become an empire? Why did people just like you, in real time, see their citizenship evaporate? Why did that happen? And overwhelmingly, the conclusion was the following, that there is another side to freedom and liberty, and it's called virtue. It's moral excellence, moral excellence in the leaders and in the citizens, that there is an intimate and direct relationship between the sustenance and the continuation of liberty and freedom over time in a great nation connected directly to moral excellence, character, and integrity. And the entire beginning of the conservative movement in the United States was in large part a rebellion against the arrogance, the corruption, and the lack of character and humility in the size and scope of what Washington, D.C. was becoming. By the way, in the constitutional debate, you all know that whether you were ultimately a Federalist or a Jeffersonian Republican, that all of them knew from the Roman example and from history that any nation not rooted in decentralization and wariness of power could ultimately become corrupt. Don't take my word for it. When you look at the debates, when you read what was being discussed in the streets of Philadelphia and in New York, the number one concern, the number one concern was what kind of people will lead us. It wasn't just the size and scope of government. That was huge. It wasn't merely the centrality of a written constitution. That was major. You remember that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were not even at the Constitutional Convention. Jefferson was in Paris. John Adams was in London. I'm sure they were texting and emailing all the time with the folks in Philadelphia to find how the, how the Constitution was coming together. But ultimately, they said that without a Bill of Rights, they would not support the Constitution. And what was the number one thing that men as different as Jefferson and Adams wanted in the Constitution. It was that idea in the very First Amendment of the freedom of conscience and religious liberty. In other words, it's not just a sense of liberation, right, and lack of coercion on the part of government. It was something much more fundamental that they wanted to build into the American experience the ability of virtue and good character over time. They wanted to give enormous authority, right, to civil society, to churches, to schools, to voluntary organizations. They wanted to move power downward and outward, away from a national or a federal government and out toward real Americans. And as you all know, in 21st century America, 
the exact opposite has happened. I want to tell you, however, I am an inveterate optimist. The best days for the United States are ahead of us. And despite the difficulties that we are having in our country, culture, and civilization right now, the best days are ahead of us because of a generation like you. Conservatives have learned that in an era of spiritual regression, in an age of aggressive secularization, we conservatives have learned that the things of faith and the spirit are far more important than the things of government and the institutions. And we have learned that we conservatives have to live in two ways. We have to live counterculturally, and we have to live transformatively. Let me say it another way. The exciting thing about being a young American in 21st century America is that we have a country, a culture, and a civilization to reform and to preserve. And I feel very confident, very confident, that your generation is going to move us into that direction. I was in a debate last week, a major debate, and I was the only conservative on the stage. And we went through almost an hour in this debate of all of the things that America needed to do in the 21st century, right, to move us forward. It was about expanding, they said, the members on the Supreme Court, right? It was about further opening our borders. It was about what they called the liberation of the human spirit. We all know what that kind of talk means. And when it came around to me, praise God, I was the fourth and final uh, speaker, I said, no, 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 we need to focus on limiting the role of Washington, D.C., shrinking the government, shrinking the regulations, shrinking the tax base, but increasing the quotient of character and virtue in the rising generation of young Americans. And one of the women on the stage actually laughed out loud. She said, you are articulating a vision, are you not, of 1941? And I said, no, quite the opposite. We know what happened at Pearl Harbor in 1941. I said, you need to get out more. I said, you need to come to Young America's Foundation. I invited her to come. She thought this was very humorous. I said, come to Young America's Foundation and meet the next generation of senators, congressmen and women, presidents of the United States, governors, local officials. But above all, above all, come meet the young people who understand that culture leads. Culture is far more important than politics. It is the left wing that believes that if we can just get the right political quotient, that we will move the country forward. But it is conservatives who know that you have to get the culture right first. And we've got a tall task ahead of us. May I ask you all a question? And please be candid. How many of you feel great about the future of the United States of America. I've been asking this question over time, especially to young conservatives. When I began asking this question 20 years ago, almost all the hands went up. And you can plot on a graph over time that some of the hands have gone down. It's not because any of you believe less in the United States of America, but you live every day in the culture, and you see what has happened. And you are, in my view, here today because you want something better and different for the country. And at the expense of sermonizing or lecturing or being Solomonic, I want to stop here for a moment. 
I want to pretend we've all been best friends for 500 years, and I want to open this up for a conversation and a dialogue about some of the things I've spoken today, and I want to hear from you and respond about the idea of the centrality of marriage, family, parenting, the preciousness of human life and religious liberty as we go forward in the country, and I'd like to hear from you about your ideas and thoughts about how we move forward as a country. And as I say, I want to pretend that we've all been best friends, so there's no shy people here. I'd like to hear uh, who you are, where you're from, and any question you have, I promise I will be as candid as I possibly can. So let's, let's stop there for a moment, and let's, let's open it up. I'd like to hear from you. Yeah. All right, we're ready for our Q&A portion. Uh, as Mr. Gaglin said, please just come up, state your name, what school you're from, and a brief question. You can line up at the back of the room right over there. On any topic. Hello there. Hi, my name is Naomi Chafee. Um, nice to see you. It's good to see you, too. Um, so when I'm looking at the culture of America, yes. I think that a big problem is that we are seeing divorced families or yes. fatherless homes. So how do we go about changing that in the culture? I am thrilled you asked that. In 1965, a very famous demographer looked at black America and found that in 1965, 25% of all black Americans were born out of wedlock. And in 1965, he called that a crisis. That number today is 75%, right? 53% of all Hispanic Americans are born out of wedlock. And for all native-born white Americans, that number is 33%, one third. The majority of babies born in America to women who are 30 years of age and over are born out of wedlock. So over here, to your question, the political class is telling us we have a border crisis, and we do. And they're telling us that we have a regulation crisis, and we do. In fact, the largest crisis we have in the United States today is a fatherlessness crisis. We have gigantic numbers of Americans who are born in homes where their biological father is not a presence in their lives between the ages of birth and 18. And it seems to me that if we are going to deal with this, we have to stop doing and addressing this problem in the way that we've done now for nearly 50 years. And you know what I'm going to say, spend more government money, right? I know you're standing up. Most people are sitting down. Since the great society of the 1960s, we have spent over a trillion dollars on this issue, and the numbers are getting bet, uh, get going up and not going down, right? Government incentivizes fatherlessness, and it incentivizes the breakdown of the American family, right? My view is not one of despair or discouragement. I think that's a sin because it negates the, the, you know, the, the, the option of hope. But my very strong view is that we have to re-energize civil society in the United States. Churches, parishes, I could go on and on and on. All of those voluntary institutions that help to build up and strengthen the family is the direction that we need to go. And I think young people who want to be married and want to have children, they want to be incentivized to do so, but not by Washington, D.C., right? May I say, in the community where you, where, where you are from, do you see this problem? So I'm from North Dakota. Yes, indeed. So I would say, in my experience, typically no, but we right. do have a lot of reservations in North Dakota, yes. and I think that you see it, typically see that more on that aspect. Yes. May, may I say, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States issued a report earlier this year, and I think, I mean, I, I want to be very careful about this because it's the Biden-Harris administration, 
But the Surgeon General issued a report which I read and thought was quite remarkable and sobering, which is that we are actually in the midst of a loneliness crisis in the United States, right? And so much of this comes, right, from real Americans who do not feel a connection to a church, to a parish, to a house of work, or even to what we would all call as a basic community, right? And so I think we have to work overtime, as we are doing at Focus on the Family, to shore up marriage, to shore up parenting, to shore up strong families. There's, there's no panacea or easy answer, but the one thing we know we have to stop doing is empowering government to undermine all the institutions that we believe in so passionately. Are you hopeful in that regard? Yes. I think I have to convince you. <laughs> May I tell you, in South, this is very important in North Dakota, in the way that you live each day and each week, what do you observe uh, in, in communities? I mean, because this question is very important. I think that when I'm looking at like people my age, and I guess even the generation above me, um, I see a lot of discourse and a lot of people not wanting to be a part of the community. Um, right. And that being like in the nuclear family is not encouraged anymore, and like the sex sexualization right. of our culture is just yes. so. It, it's just everyone is just doing it now that it's like right. Right. It, people aren't being encouraged to have kids within the right. family marriage, and that they would rather just like yes. go sleep around and not right. understand the consequences. My friend, I'm very glad you brought this up because our major cultural institutions are completely controlled by the left. All of our major universities and colleges, right? Much of the brass of the United States military, all of the uh, uh, public school uh, uh, systems in the United States, right? Hollywood, Silicon Valley, Wall Street. You know, we can no longer look to, to, to say Silicon Valley can help resolve this, or Hollywood, or Broadway. I mean, it's, I mean that, that, this is where the left repairs, OK? This is not Silicon Valley's country. This is not Wall Street or Hollywood's country or Washington, D.C.'s country. This is our country, right? And it begins as conservatives at the local and regional level. I think we have to rediscover that and then help to nourish and replenish those roots. Right, be of good cheer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hello, sir. My name is Caitlin Ricker, and I go to Georgetown University. Nice to see you. You as well. And you were just talking about- Are you a Washingtonian? No, I'm from Indiana originally. Oh, great, so am I. Oh, really, where from? I like you even better. Oh, awesome. Yes. I'm well, from Fort Wayne, Indiana, the center of the universe. OK, I'm from Indianapolis. I, I, I have lived and worked here for 35 years, but I'm like a potted plant, which is that all of the views and values and principles that I was raised with, uh, I have never forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 I, and I bring all of those people and all the things they taught me uh, uh, from the Midwest here. I absolutely agree, and I feel the same way. I'm thankful that. Indiana gave me the character that I have, yes. and I think a lot of that comes from church, yes. being raised in church, and you were yes. just talking about civil society Indeed. like church. Yes. And my question for you is, about 30% of Americans now identify as non-religious. That's and correct. We just talked about how valuable church and civil society is yes. in building these morals and character, but how do we get people to actually go back to church or go to these communities? Because we live in a free country where we can't say you have to be involved in such and such civil society. Right. I'm really thrilled that you asked this. I have, um, I'm paid to read the data, OK? Uh, and I uh, annually read the, the, the Pew uh, surveys and the Gallup surveys. This is very reliable data, OK? And uh, increasingly, young people who are disaffected from historic churches, parishes, worship, et cetera. But not just that, also from kind of civic community life, right? Voluntary organizations. But focusing specifically now for a moment on faith, all right? What I find heartening and encouraging in the numbers you cite is that it gets reported that young people are you know, disaffected and disbelieving. But when you read the cross tabs of the research, that's not the case. They are disaffected from historic denominations. 
they uh, are uncomfortable in kind of brick and mortar institutions that they feel are confining. But when they're asked the question about agnosticism or atheism in the United States, those numbers are very low compared to the entire developed world. You cannot go to one Western, Eastern, or Central European country, right, and find your demography, the rising generation, right, of, of young people who are actually more religious and spiritual than the United States, even as those numbers climb. But what you find in other developed countries is, is, is an authentic young person who says, I am agnostic or I just don't believe. That is not the case in the United States. People do believe or they're, or they're working it out, but it doesn't often fit into the, into, the, into the typical structures. So I'm encouraged that even as the so-called nuns, right, uh, even as those numbers increase, when you look at the data and the research, what you find is that actual agnosticism or atheism is very low in your generation. And, and a sense of kind of uh, people who have faith, who believe in God, and so forth, is actually much higher uh, than your uh, comparison to the generations in every other developed country. So I take heart that we need to go tell a new generation, right? We're conservatives. We don't believe in revolution, right? Edmund Burke himself said you have to reform in order to preserve. So I think we have to reform in order to preserve. We have to go share, right, the faith. We have to be very eager to be patient because it's it's one on one. And I must say, uh, I you know I I welcome social media. I really do. I think it's I think it, it's it's a boon and a blessing in many ways. But I think it's also very easily to be digitally distracted, and we have to be more intentional about relationships. If I had a bumper sticker, it would have two words, relationships matter. And over time, they do. Invest in other people. Invest in friendship. Above all, invest in family. The natural nuclear family is absolutely fantastic. I've been married 32 years on our way to forever. Marriage is not easy. Marriage is, is hard work, but it's well worth it. Children, terrific. Grandchildren, terrific. It takes time. It takes patience. But it's all rooted ultimately, in my view, in faith. Right? Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Max Langman, and I go to Liberty University. Nice to see you. <laughs> I, I've been an adjunct professor in the School of Government at Liberty for 17 years. Oh, really? Yes. Um, well, I love the name, Liberty. Yeah. 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 Um, so my question is kind of, um, I see people, uh, especially where I live, I live in California. Yes. Uh, people are, where in California are you from? San Diego. Okay, sure. Um, a lot of people are going back to church. Yes, they are. Um, but I feel like as a community based on what I'm seeing, it's like they go in, they feel good, and then 10 minutes later they completely forget about the whole message. Right. So I'm, I guess my question is how do we, or how could I or any other people kind of like help them kind of live out the Christian life, I guess? George Orwell famously said that the first duty of an intelligent person is to restate the obvious. And sometimes uh, as believing Christians or believing Jews, sometimes I think we take too much for granted. That we assume that because we've been raised this way or have been taught this way, right, that most everybody else has as well. But for many of the reasons that I talked about this morning, we're at a different place in the United States, right? So I think in my strongly held view, we have to build relationships with other people we have to earn their trust and right to be heard. And then at that point, we have to share the gospel of life. And I think that that is the beauty of faith, right? That we don't push it, right? We don't lobby for it, but we share it organically. And I think it takes time. But the, but the beautiful thing is the, is, is the following. And I, I feel this with, with every fiber of my being. The thing is, faith has a power of its own. And there will come a moment in everybody, I hope nobody here has ever been in a crisis. I pr I've been in a crisis. 
and I, and I pray that no one here has ever been in one. But, we, but if you have been in a crisis, you realize that you might be a strong person in every manner, but ultimately, uh, we are made for something bigger, that we're made for eternity. We're made for a relationship with God himself. And it's not just kind of emotional reassurance. There is timber and strength in that relationship. And I think it's very concurrent uh, with the best in the American experience. In the United States, faith is a fundamental part uh, of the building of our country, right? No Judeo-Christian tradition, no United States of America. They go together. And, and I feel confident, confident, that even in California, we will, in the years ahead, see a, a, a remarkable revitalization and restoration. I believe an American restoration is coming. And I think that even in the seedlings of destruction that we've discussed today, even in that moment, there are uh, signs of renewal. And uh, the best days, as I say, for our country are ahead of us, but they are concurrent, in my view, with a revitalization of faith. Yeah, take heart. Thank right, right. Hello, uh, my name is Joshua King from Brigham Young University. Nice to uh, see you. I was just in Salt Lake. Oh, really? Yeah, just okay. off the airplane yesterday. Wow, all right. Well, I yeah. uh, hope you had a good experience. I well, did. I had a great experience. Um, You're from a great state. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, actually, originally from Texas, but I've... That's another time. great state. <laughs> Clearly, a lot of people agree. Um, yes. So I just wanted to say that I completely agree um, mm -hmm. with everything that you said about mm -hmm. God and family. Um, being as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ myself, that's, yes. of course, deep tenant. Um, however, I had a question. Is what do you see as the um, eventual buildup of this? Because um, as we know, like God and family is the center building arc of everything. However, I feel like uh, as a lot of conservatives today, we see all of these people in uh, the high echelons of power yes. having like, all of this influence um, from the top pushing down. How, what is your vision for um, the eventual takeover mm -hmm. of the bottom overturning that because I feel like a lot of people have um, the sense of hopelessness that even if we are building from the bottom up that we'll never be able to overturn what we believe as this um, incorrect vision for America. That's a fantastic and a very thoughtful question. Uh, I want to say two things if I may. The first is the following. We're in Washington DC. We are now meeting in the heart of the swamp, right? Okay, here we are on a swampy day. And um, in this town, the word power and the word influence are used interchangeably, but they're not the same. Poly, uh, you know, someone who is powerful is someone who's been elected to something or been nominated and confirmed to something, a president, a Supreme Court justice, a US senator, right? But influence is different. When you are a genuine, measurable influencer, you are a person who powerful people say, what do you think? And my view is that the best kind of influencer, not the worst, is a person of immeasurable virtue, character, and integrity who can cut through the political battle of the day and for good share the first principles of faith, of family, of freedom, of the elemental goodness of the United States and a constitutional principle. I want to be very bold here and very categorical. If anybody articulates the way forward for the United States of America and does not put the family at the center, faith at the center, right? They're, they're whistling in the wind. It's not going to happen. Right? We know from history that revitalization, renewal, restoration can happen in a country, in a culture, in a civilization, but not without the elemental things of the spirit. And the great thing about this extraordinary country is that the history of the United States is rooted in the things that you're asking about, right? 
So the question is not how Washington uh, you know, can leverage this or the other institutions. And by the way, politics is important. Politics is a branch of ethics, but it's not more important than what happens in the home, in our neighborhood, right? In our church or parish. I've just written my third book, right? It's called Toward a More Perfect Union, The Moral and Cultural Case for Teaching the Great American Story, right? We have to go relearn the first principles and build from there, and I believe we're going to do it, right? And we're counting on you, right? I'll come visit you in your Senate office in, in a few years. All right, thank you. All right, we'll be taking one last question. Terrific. Hi, I'm Good Nicole. Morning. I go to the University of Tampa. Terrific. So both the left and the right have differences within their own realms, but the left seems way more successful at rallying together despite their differences. So how can conservatives, especially regarding the culture, get better at this while still holding on to our individual values? I love that question, and it's one word, fusionism. You know, historically in the conservative movement, the people who were more libertarian oriented or focused on economics, the people who were more hawkish in foreign policy, uh, you know, rooted in anti-communism, and then people more like me, a, a traditional conservative, right, a morals-based uh, you know, conservative. The three camps that comprised American conservatism, we got together and we determined that we were not going to articulate all the things on which we disagreed, but from the great Ronald Reagan, we learned that someone who agrees with you 80% of the time is called your friend, right? The left is eager. They are eager to, uh, to put their differences aside in all the different camps of the left, and there are many. And they are eager to say, but what do we have in common? And as we all know, it's from there that they leverage forward. In my view, 21st century American conservatism has to become comfortable that the purpose of what we do, if we are going to move forward from a conservative worldview, is to not get into room, rooms with other conservatives and begin to argue and fight about all the things that we disagree about, but it's to get into a room and to say, but what do we agree about? And it seems to me that in 21st century American conservatism, other than the things that I've spoken about at length this morning, the one thing that we overwhelmingly agree on is the centrality of the United States Constitution. If we lose the Constitution, we will never get it back. And it seems to me that the way forward for your generation and frankly, my generation of conservatism in this century is to refocus with other conservatives, not on the 20% where we disagree, but in the Reagan-esque view of the 80% where we do agree, rooted in the Constitution and say that's the way forward. And I feel very confident that we're already doing that. Uh, I, I want to mix and match for one moment. 2024 is on the cusp, right? We're going into an incredibly consequential year. Hand over heart for the last time. I feel confident it's going to be a really good year for conservatives. I believe we are going to win the White House. I believe we are going to win the United States Senate. I believe we are going to win the House of Representatives. And I believe we are going to win the majority of governorships and the majority of the state legislatures. And that means that we are going to move forward in a brilliant way on the future of the United States Supreme Court and the federal courts. Good things are on the horizon, but ultimately rooted in the, in the timelessness of the institutions that we're talking about. Yeah. Are you ready to win? Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> Buckle up. Here we go. That concludes our Q&A portion. Thank you, Mr. Gagelin. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the greatest country in the history of man, the United States of America. Thank you all.
the honor of introducing our next speaker, Speaker Newt Gingrich. He goes by many names. These include distinguished visiting scholar and professor at the National Defense University, New York Times best-selling author, 50th speaker of the House of Representatives, and many more impressive titles. Speaker Gingrich is one of the most accomplished Americans alive and has dedicated his life to defending our great nation. But there is a lot more to him than these remarkable achievements. As an author, he has published 41 books, including 18 fiction and nonfiction New York Times bestsellers. Today, he is a Fox News contributor, podcast host, and syndicated columnist, where he continues to advocate bold policy ideas. Now please join me in welcoming Speaker Newt Gingrich. You know, I've, I've spoken to many of these annual gatherings and one of the reasons I'm always willing to do it is you guys are so generous when I walk in uh, that I just I feel better just by the act of how nice you are and how much you applaud. So I want to encourage you to continue that tradition. It's a, it does make a difference. Look, I, I, it occurred to me um, that if I were your age, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about politics and we'll do Q&A and you can go wherever you want to, but it occurred to me that there are things I learned over the years that might actually be practical that you can apply whatever you're gonna do. And I wrote the book that you just got, March the Majority, in part as a playbook for how we actually did it. It's, while it's a history, it's actually designed for today. Because it took us, it took me three races to win a congressional seat. I lost in 1974 in Watergate, and 1976 with Jimmy Carter at the head of the Democratic ticket. Then, when I finally won in 78, I said, gee, you know, we've been in a minority for 24 years in the House. Shouldn't we have a plan to become a majority? And they said, that's a great idea. Uh, why don't you chair the planning committee? So before I was even sworn in, I was in planning how would we get to be a majority. Now, I want you to know it was a much bigger mountain than I thought. We tried in 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, and 92. And finally, after 16 years, we became a majority in 94, and people said, well, that was a really good year. Well, yeah, but all the years before that, we were learning, we were making mistakes, we were growing, uh, and we had to build a new party, both a new party in size. Uh, the House Republican Party just wasn't big enough. It was like a mid-sized college team playing in the Super Bowl. And we had to learn a new style of politics, which we did largely from Ronald Reagan. And so this book is really designed to, share the, to, to give you a feel both for how we did it and for what the lessons were that made it possible not only to get elected for the first time in 40 years as a majority, but two years later to get reelected for the first time since 1928. And in fact, if you think about it, from 1930 to 1994, the Democrats controlled the House every election except for four years in that entire period. Since 1994, we've controlled the House more than they have. And 1994 was a genuine cultural tsunami because we picked up eight Senate seats, 10 governorships, and 470 state legislators because we won the argument in the country, which is one of the keys. So here are a couple of lessons that are in the book, but you can also write them down because they apply directly to you. The first is, I tell people, you, you ought to dream big, particularly when you're young. You ought to dream big but then you have to plan to work hard, learn every day, and be true to yourself. Now those four things allow you to have a life that's really fascinating and to do things that you'll look back on in later years and think, gosh, how did I get there? And how did this happen? Because life is a lot bigger than you are. Uh, second, we really try to teach our teams a very simple four-word process, and it's a process. It's one, two, three, four. It's not a hierarchy. Listen, learn, help, and lead. When you go back to your colleges or you go back home, try it out. The first thing I try to do in every meeting 
is listen to the other people. The world changes, new things happen, and I know that I don't necessarily know. Now when you listen, and I'm, by listening I mean really, and by the way, you can apply this. You go to some kind of a cocktail party and the person next to you is babbling and you're standing there being bored. If you can figure out what they've done or what they know that you don't know, you can suddenly turn it into a really educational conversation. So they've been in Sicily and you haven't. Well, what was Sicily like? But that means you've got to be open to learning about whatever it is that comes up next. Now, if you listen to people and you learn from them, you almost always help them. The reason is simple. Think about your own life. People get it out in the open. They get it off their chest. They ventilate. And in a lot of cases, as they tell you their problem, they'll suddenly figure out the solution because they get it out of themselves and they can now look at it. If people know that you will listen to them, learn from them, and help them, they'll ask you to lead. When they ask you to lead, first thing you should do is say, this is my vision of where we're going. This is my strategies. These are my strategies for getting there. And these are my proposed tactics. And you immediately go back and say, what do you think? And so you turn every person into an advisor. And they enrich you by telling you what they think of your, you don't try to sell them your plan. You try to offer the plan and then listen to them and prove it. And that process of doing it over and over and over, things change. By 1994, we had changed the culture of the House Republican Party enough that we could offer a contract with America that had 10 items and that we committed to vote on in the first 100 days. And we had all but three of our members sign the contract. And we had one chairman who came in to see me and said, you know, I actually wasn't for all this. And his committee happened to have three of the items. And I said, well, here's, here's the deal. You signed the contract. Now, if you don't want to report it out of your committee, I'm confident that the new chairman will. And he said, well, you know, now that you've explained it to me in a positive way, I think I'll get them all out of the committee. And he did. He got them all out of the committee. But that happened because he, we'd, get, we'd had him buy in early. Now, the truth is, they were so used to losing that none of them thought we'd win. So, they, well, you know, if Newt wants this, this is a silly contract, what, what do I care? It's not going to happen anyway. And then all of a sudden it did happen, and they're going, oh, you mean I really signed this? And now we had begun to build a different party. We, at our peak, we were sending out 55,000 GOPAC training tapes every month. So we were literally training the entire base activists of the Republican Party, including the candidates, uh, including people like Pataki running for governor. Um, so this whole process of learning and then teaching is important. A couple more specifics. Anything you really want to get done probably takes time and is probably hard. And we coined the term cheerful persistence. If you're not willing to persist, you're not going to get anything. But in America, you know, grumpy persistence, angry persistence, depressed persistence, they don't work. I mean, think about your friends. If your friend's grumpy all the time, you don't want to listen to them. If they're depressed, how are they going to lead you? And so you have to be cheerful. And if you are cheerful, it's a, it's a very strange part of American culture. If you're cheerful, you can get away with almost anything. Now, the leadership didn't particularly like me. The leadership was used to losing. They were used to being you know, pleasant with the Democrats and getting crumbs off the table from the Democrats. And I was causing trouble. But as long as I went to them cheerfully, they had a very hard time saying no. So I'd go in and say, you know, we really have to become a majority, don't we? Well, you can't be the leader and say no. So they thought, this guy's stupid. We're not going to become a majority. But, I, but he had, I have to say yes. I said, great. Well, since we have to become a majority, we're going to do X. And I, a little minor trick here. You never ask for a yes. You ask for a no. Remember, if the person who has to give you permission is risk averse, they won't want to say yes. But guess what? They won't want to say no either. So I would always say, you know, unless you object, I'm going to go do X. Well, they didn't want to object because that, that put the burden on them. But then that meant I had to carry the burden of doing it. And occasionally, frankly, it blew up. I mean, I, you know, I, I got a reputation. Uh, for one, somebody once said I had 10 ideas a day and one of them was good. Uh, you know, but 
I, I was churning. I was trying to figure out how to do this. Once we won, we negotiated with Clinton. And the size of our majority was so great that they literally had a White House meeting in June of 95. And the liberals on the White House staff said, you have to stand up to Gingrich and you have to fight for liberalism. And Clinton, who had been the youngest governor in the country in 1978, lost in 1980. And he lost the governorship, he lost the, the state police car, he lost the airplane, and he'd, he lost his salary. And so he'd figured out losing was not good. And he said to the White House staff, if I do what you want, I'm gonna lose the presidency in 96. But if I work with Gingrich, I might get reelected. So we sat down, we, we got welfare reform, we got Medicare reform, FDA reform, telecommunications reform. Uh, we ultimately had the largest capital gains tax cut in history. Uh, and we balanced the federal budget for four straight years for the only time in your lifetime. And the trick was really simple. I, mean, I can tell you the model. In a free society, everybody has to win. So think of it as setting up a box. One side of the box is what he has to have. One side of the box is what I have to have. Part of the box is what he cannot give up. And part of the box is what I can't give up. Now, in between those four sides, there's a deal somewhere. But you have to be aware of all four sides. And you have to think it through, and it takes a lot of creativity. We, we met for 35 straight days, not straight days, we met for 35 days, face to face, uh, in getting the balanced budget done. And that's what it took. It took a lot of listening and learning. So those are just general ideas. I'll give you one last one that may surprise you. If you can train the people you work with to learn to say yes if, rather than no because, you will get a dramatic increase in productivity. Now let me, let me give you, think about just the way humans react. I have an idea. Why don't we have pizza for lunch? You say no, we can't have pizza for lunch. Now first of all, no is a downer. You just rejected me. Now I gotta decide, do I care enough about getting pizza that I'm gonna argue with you? Or do I just kind of withdraw because you hurt my feelings? But if you said, yes, we could get pizza for lunch if only we had money. Now first of all, you just gave me the same information for, as the no. Yeah. But because you said yes, I feel better. You listened to me and you made, you made me feel good. And then I can say something clever like, I have a credit card. <laughs> now, if you, if you literally chart this out, think about it. When you say no, the other person is stopped. Their feelings are hurt, and they have to decide whether or not they care enough to argue. When you say yes, they have an increase in endorphins. You've now validated them. They're a smart person, that's a good idea. Unfortunately, we can't do it because we don't have any money. Because you said yes, we're now in a conversation. You didn't, you didn't end the conversation. You continued the conversation. So a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> a lot of the, what I just told you is how Kevin McCarthy is running the House. He has an extraordinarily hard job, much harder than mine. I, uh, first of all, I was the guy who brought us out of the wilderness after 40 years. So people will need to say, OK, what, you know, that worked. Why don't we try some more? Uh, second. I had a much bigger majority. The how you can, you can really understand the Congress if you understand a very simple principle. The Senate is a country club. The House is a truck stop. <laughs> and in the truck stop, you have 435 senior class presidents. Every single one of them has won their race themselves. They represent their district. They arrive as co-equals. They each have ideas, and they each believe in their ideas. And they have pretty strong egos or they couldn't survive politics. And so you get your side of it in the room, and in Kevin's case, his side is only like a five-vote margin. So any morning that six of them are mad at him, he doesn't have a majority. So he's got to figure that, I, I tell people it's like riding a bicycle. <laughs> He has to keep forward momentum to keep the bicycle up. Because the minute he stops, there are gonna be 20 of them who are mad. And then it's very hard to put back together. Now, 
he went through, I mean, how many of you are aware that he, it took him 15 rounds to get to be speaker? Okay. Uh, now think about this. I mean, it took, we, we actually last night had a wonderful uh, retirement party for Dan Meyer. Dan Meyer is the only person in history to serve as chief of staff to two speakers. He was my chief of staff. He came back to become Kevin's chief of staff. And part of the retirement gift was a picture of the three of us and then the actual congressional record vote from the day I was sworn in and the day that Kevin was sworn in. I was pointing out to Kevin that I actually won on the first round. <laughs> but I had a much bigger majority. Uh, Kevin, on the other hand, took 15 rounds. But he had a very simple project. And this, is to get, this is an example of thinking strategically. Kevin's job for 15 votes, imagine you're sitting on the House floor for the eight or nine or 10 minutes that the vote takes. And then you're, you don't make it. And then you get nominated again. And you're sitting there and you don't make it. He had two jobs. Smile. Remember, cheerful persistence. This is the American process at work. It's taking a little time, but we're all here together. And look like he's going to win. Because if he communicates confidence, his 200 will stick with him. If his 200 will stick with him, at some point, the others will say, OK, we've had enough fun. We're never going to break through. Let's cut a deal. And that's what happened. So he gets up every Monday morning, knowing he has to put back together the last five, six, seven, nine votes, every single day. And he practices basically what I just told you. He listens very, very well. He tries to figure out how to help each member a little bit. Most of the time that works. I, mean, I had a couple members, one of whom I had known for 25 years. And I'd go to him and say, I really need your vote. He said, I can't do it. Totally safe Republican seat. And I'd say, what do you mean you can't do it? He said, I don't, I don't like that. I'm not going to do it. And I'd go, please? No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I mean, and that's where cheerful persistence, you have to have real discipline. Because what you really want to do, of course, is scream at him and take away his office and not allow him to fly home anymore and do anything you can to use the power. And you know that that's just self-defeating because he's a freely elected person and he's allowed to be a fool. I mean, there's no, there's, there, I always tell people, out of 435 House members, a minimum of 10 are weird. I mean, it's just guaranteed. Now, I personally think it's like eight Democrats and two Republicans, but I think if Pelosi were here, she would tell you it's like eight Republicans and two Democrats. But th that means your planning process, you've got to be, and some of you, again, if you're in fraternities or sororities or organizations, like student organizations, you'll have some people, it's, it's, it's part of the human system. There'll be a couple people you can't deal with. And it's just life. And then you've got to figure out how you're going to manage you in order to manage them. Because your first reaction is to get so frustrated that you want to do something. So one or two more things. And I, I really want to get to questions because you guys, it's always more fun when you get a chance to ask whatever you want to. And you kind of educate me by what you want to know. So a couple quick things. Um, by the way, I understand that, that Vivek was here last night. Uh, did, did he do a pretty good job? Yeah. I, I, should tell, I should tell you a brief commercial. Uh, we do, at Gingrich 360, I do three newsletters a week and three podcasts. They're all free. We've done two podcasts with Vivek, and then I did his podcast before he announced. Uh, I think he's very smart, and, and I think he may presently be uh, a serious contender. Uh, you know, he's, he, he's growing. Uh, he's articulate. He's energetic. He's different. In many ways, he is to this round what Trump was in 16. He's, he's the non-politician business guy. Uh, who, and, and I think uh, I'm, I, I'm very impressed with him. Uh, and I think he has a great future. Um, so a couple of political com comments. Because um, you're going to ask it anyway. Uh, I think the odds are very, very high that Trump will be the Republican nominee. In fact, I think they're higher. That Okay, we now know where the Trump faction sits. They all get together over there in the corner and say, okay, all the Trump people sit here. Uh, the, uh, I think the odds are higher that Trump will be the nominee than Biden. 
because I think Biden is on a long downward curve. Uh, and part of what keeps him propped up is Kamala. Uh, I keep telling people you would never want to actually impeach Biden because then you'd get Kamala and Kamala. Kamala, without corruption and without cognitive confusion, is more dangerous to the future of America than Biden is. Um, so I think you've got to be careful about that. Um, I, think, I think the great challenge, and it's going to be fascinating to watch it play out, the House Republicans are the one center of conservatism in the city. Obviously, a Democratic president who's a socialist, which is what he really is, um, is not going to be for conservatism. And the Senate Republicans are split. I would say about a third of the Senate Republicans think that uh, this conservative stuff is weird. Uh, and again, remember I said it's a country club. And so they think you, you, know, you sort of have to say you're for those things, but you don't want to vote for them. Uh, and so the, the pressure on, on McCarthy to figure out the right balance. And if you watched him in the debt ceiling fight, the trick was to create a fortress. They passed a bill and they stopped. And they said, we don't, you know, we're not going to get into some weird negotiation with the Senate Democrats. We're going to talk only to Biden. And the baseline of our conversation is the bill we passed, because we have the only bill that passed. And they have to do that over and over and over again. Uh, and it's going to be very challenging. Uh, I'll say two last things. One, the scale of change we need to survive as a country is enormous. Your generation is going to have to fundamentally take apart the entire elite bureaucratic state and rebuild the American system that works. I'm just doing a paper now on, on federalism and de Tocqueville and, and Lincoln. Lincoln fought the Civil War with six people on the White House staff. The attorney general had like nine people. The, the State Department headquarters had 28 people, four of whom were night watchmen. Um, this entire gigantic government bureaucracy just walked down the street. Look at these huge buildings. They symbolize the centralization of power in Washington. They are a direct threat to freedom. And if you doubt that, uh, I suggest two TV series one called Yes Minister, and the other called Yes Prime Minister. They were do both done by Anthony Jay, who was an advisor to Margaret Thatcher. And he would actually go to the government, find some example that was insane, turn it into comedy, and then make it into a TV show. It was Margaret Thatcher's favorite show. And I really urge you to watch it, because you'll begin to realize how dense and difficult managing these bureaucracies is because they're, they're totally self-protecting and totally self-serving. So your generation has to, one, figure out how it's going to fundamentally change the power structure by which the elites govern America. Two, you have to have an honest assessment of what it's going to take to compete with China and India. I mean, these are huge countries. Uh, they are going to be enormous competitors. Uh, and frankly, if we don't fix our education system, we will fail. I mean, you cannot have people graduating who can't do anything. We have 21 schools in Baltimore City in which not a single student can do math. Not one. Now, how are they going to compete with the Chinese? And so you have, a, you have a crisis of your institutions, and your benchmark ought to be, what does it take to remain the most successful country in the world? And that's a level of wrenching change at every level. And you're going to have to do it. Either that or you're going to have to accept sliding into subservience and allowing both your domestic bureaucracy and your foreign dominant countries to define the rest of your life. So your generation will be called to a huge challenge. I think you can rise to the occasion. We have, we've done this before, but it is a real challenge. And it's going to be, a, I think, a very exciting time. And we're going to have to learn a lot to get it done. So if it's OK, I'm just going to toss it back to you guys. Please step up, say your name, what school you get to, and a brief question. Uh, Mr. Gingrich, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Arthur Bertsinian. Uh, I study in Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm originally from Moscow, Russia, and you know I uh, I was born and raised in a very conservative environment for you know very progressive environment here in America. 
And, uh, you know, my school is very, very far left. You know, we all have pronouns, you know, all of those craziness. And uh, when it comes to abortion, you know, a lot of people are pro-choice and, you know, professors are very liberal to say that uh, there's a privacy clause, an equal protection clause that justifies abortion. And, uh, you know, I had just a hard, hard time uh, arguing about that. And I just want to know uh, your opinion why uh, this doesn't justify abortion. Thank you. Well, first of all, I don't think that there's any, personally, I don't think that there's any clear argument. Uh, the, question, the question becomes whether or not you're dealing with life. Okay? So if a fetus is not alive, then the privacy clause may apply. If you think, on the other hand, that upon conception the fetus is alive, the question then becomes, what's the level of protection that that second life deserves? And can you find a balance that both protects the woman and that protects the baby. Uh, and I think most Americans have concluded that, there, that, that abortion can be acceptable up to a certain point, but that there is a time after which it really becomes the equivalent of, of killing the baby. And for most Americans, that's about 15 weeks. Uh, on the left, they've gone to the point of saying, not only can you kill the baby on the ninth month at the, on the last day, but in at least two states, there are bills in the legislature to, get, to allow you to have up to 30 days after the baby's born to decide whether or not to kill it. Uh, that's a straight out argument about whether or not babies are alive. So if, again, if you think the baby doesn't exist, I, I, look, I was converted to a more aggressive pro-life position by a woman who came up to me at a, at a luncheon one time and said, that is not a fetus, as far as I am concerned, uh, that is just an organism like a cancer. And I said, let me get this straight. So I get, I get to choose when I, when I look at, when I look at the, the sonogram, that's just a random organ like a cancer, or it's a baby. I decided I wasn't much into the cancer concept. Um, but I think people who do believe, in fact, that the baby doesn't exist, have a legitimate argument, but it's an argument. It's not, they, they don't have the right then to impose that on others. Uh, and you have to make a decision. Okay. Hi, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Tyler Seaman. I am a student at Gettysburg College. Go Bullets. And I just finished interning for a member of the House Freedom Caucus. What, uh, what is their greatest strength and their greatest weakness? Okay, well, first of all, I'm delighted to see you. I, uh, my dad went to Gettysburg College, and I have a niece that graduated from Gettysburg, and one of my really close friends is Alan Gelzo, who for years taught uh, Civil War history at Gettysburg. Um, the, uh, the Freedom Caucus's greatest strength is the intensity of its commitment to returning to constitutional government and its willingness to take on the various uh, assumptions of the modern welfare state. Uh, its greatest weakness is that it has a very hard time understanding the, uh, uh, one of the points Reagan made. Reagan had led a strike. He, he was the head of a union, uh, and he led a strike in Hollywood, which had huge consequences. It, it created the modern royalty system where people got money whenever their movie was shown or their TV series was shown. And so he understood negotiating. And Reagan would always, we did a movie, Cliss and I did a movie called uh, Rendezvous with Destiny <clears throat> about Reagan. And he always said, if you can get 70 or 80%, take the deal. And then come back next week and go for the other 20 or 30. The Freedom Caucus is in the 99% league. And that's, that's a weakness because <clears throat> Again, even if you're 40 members out of 435, that still means you have 400, you know, 395 other members. And so your ability to, to coerce them or, or, or blackmail them without them having a countervailing ability to then coerce you makes it very hard to manage. And I would say if they could stand firmly for their principles, push it as hard as they could every single morning, take 60, 70, 80 percent and come back the next day, they would get a lot more done. They probably wouldn't feel quite as good because uh, there's, a, there's a strength in purity and saying, you know, I stand firm for this no matter what. But as a level of practical getting things done, I think it doesn't work. Okay?
Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My name is Matt McDonald. I go to the University of Alabama, and my question pertains to the 2020 election, 2022 election, sorry. Although Republicans retook the House, there was no red wave that was expected comparable to the 20, 1994 Republican Revolution. What do you believe is the root cause of that, and how can we prevent an underwhelming election from happening again? I think there, first of all, it's a great question. I was wrong. I thought there would be a wave. Uh, and uh, I had to spend a lot of time after the election trying to figure out what, you know, what is it I didn't understand. Um, and I would say it's a couple things. Uh, first of all, the Republican consultants are out of sync with the modern world. I'll, I'll give you an example. In Pennsylvania, the Republicans have this passion about spending your money in October. In Pennsylvania, by October 1st, 60% of the vote had been cast. So by the time they got around to running their ads, 60% of the vote was no longer available. And that's a constant challenge. So, so one, you've got to figure out, and I, I wrote a paper on this, that the, the Democrats focus on the election and Republicans focus on the campaign. So the Democrats focus on turning their vote out from day one. And, they, and the longer the process of voting, the better it is for them, because what they're doing is they, they then shrink down the number of people they have to focus on. So the first 100,000 vote, you can, that's done. Now let's go to the next 100,000. We spend an enormous amount of money on TV, partly because most of our consultants make money off television. I mean, I think, I think the consulting class really has a lot to do with this. So we have to rethink that whole process and be honest about how modern elections work. Second, um, it is only the second time in 19 off-year elections that independents did not vote against the incumbent White House. Democrats carried independents by two. Uh, I think that's because Republicans focused on mobilizing the base and they didn't think through, hey, now how am I going to attract independents? Places like Nevada, where the sheriff attracted the independents, he won the governorship handily. Uh, the Senate race where they didn't attract independents, they lost the Senate seat in the very same state. Uh, three, uh, while McCarthy had done the right thing in developing a commitment to America, it didn't, and I bear part of the burden of this because I'd been through it before. He had to do two things he didn't do. He had 150 really good ideas, which you could see if you went to commit to, to America.com. They'd all been developed by his members. They were mostly very terrific ideas. You can't sell 150 ideas. I mean, there's a reason that the contract with America had 10. I figured if that's the most that Moses could bring down from the mountain, it's probably the most you can campaign on. And, and so he, he should have taken the 10 most popular and driven the system and said, now we're also gonna do these other things, but let me tell you about these. The second thing was when we did the contract with America, Haley Barber was the Republican National Committee Chairman, and he made the commitment to us that if we could get our act together to actually have a contract, he would buy four pages of TV Guide, which at that time was in 92%, 92 million households every week. And so you can actually see it at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. We had this four-page ad that came out, and it's literally in 92 million homes the same week. Now when I'm on radio or TV talking about the contract with America, I've begun to make it into a thing. And you have to get, and then people thought we were positive. If we had run an anti-Clinton campaign, we would not have become a majority. But we ran a very positive campaign about very positive ideas, and it, it broke through. And if you go back and look at the commercials, our, our consultants now run really stupid negative commercials. Uh, and you're, you're an average person going, okay, I agree with everything you just said, but what are you going to do for me? I mean, it, it, it's not enough to just be negative. And at least that's my analysis. being with us, Mr. Speaker. My name is Jens Pfeiffer. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Washington. Uh, you said a minute ago that a weakness of the House Freedom Caucus is that they don't really have the ability to compromise. Um, but I have to say I sympathize with them uh, pretty strongly because on a lot of the issues that are prevalent today, it seems there isn't a lot of room for compromise, issues like abortion, like transgenderism, gun policy, etc. Um, so what do you see as the biggest areas where there's room for compromise in the modern political landscape? Well, if my, let's take the two you just mentioned. Okay, you can, you can have an honest discussion. If, if you were for no abortions at any time under any circumstance, it's a, it's a powerful moral position, uh, and certainly there are a lot of people who for religious reasons believe that. 
that also is a position that gets you, at most, 20% of the vote. So you actually are taking a position which guarantees the maximum number of abortions because you're not going to be able to get the society to go along with you. Now, if you say, okay, I want the minimum number of abortions I can get out of American society, then you have to listen to the American people and figure out what, what's the point, and the point's about 15 weeks. And at 15 weeks, you get over 60% of the country saying that's right, and the Democrats become the extremists. And so the question you have to ask yourself about abortion is, are you prepared to maximize the number of children we save, which won't be all of them, or are you prepared to feel morally really good while you actually maximize the number of children who die? And that's a pretty straightforward cho choice. On transgenderism, I think, I think there are two pretty straightforward arguments. One is science, and, and I'm, I'm, look, I'm sure this will get me booed off of a number of your campuses, but I'm pretty cheerful about saying that biologically there are men and women, uh, that the DNA is pretty clear, and that, that uh, it's very hard to argue that it's not true. And I, and I actually don't believe in chest feeding, as the CDC now encourages it. Uh, and I actually think mothers matter. Uh, so that obviously, may, one, it's a sign I'm old. But two, uh, at, it, at, at a cultural level, you win that fight. Um, and the fact that Democrats are no longer allowed to, de to define what a woman is makes them, frankly, look stupid to most Americans. But second, if you're going to get in a fight over transgenderism, focus on, on third grade. You know, do you really think that a third grader is, is old enough and mature enough to decide that they're confused about their gender? And do you really think that they should then be able to have medicine and operations without telling their parents? And you rapidly find that the, the most extreme transgender people will, in fact, die on that battlefield. You know, they'll come out and they'll say yes. And in fact, some of them say, you know, baby knows as early as two or three months. Well, that's a really hard position to sustain. So part of the trick is to figure out which is the argument you're going to make. Uh, and, and I think that's, you know, I, again, I, I think I'm not, what I'm describing is called politics. You know, you can, you can make a case over here for other kind of values. Um, I'll give you an, an, one other example, which I think is fascinating. Clist and I went the other night, uh, Speaker McCarthy hosted uh, The Sound of Freedom, which is a very interesting movie. And a number of critics have said, well, he, you know, he's going after kidnappers in Colombia, and that's a very small percentage of all the children who were sold into sexual slavery. Uh, in fact, the most common way you get sold into sexual slavery is somebody you know, either a relative or a friend of the family. Uh, and so therefore, uh, this, this whole thing <clears throat> is misleading. And it, it, it hit me, I just did a, new, a newsletter about this, urging President Biden to show the movie uh, on the grounds that probably we ought to be able to find a bipartisan consensus that exploiting six-year-olds sexually is inappropriate. Uh, it's, I'm out on a limb here, but I'm, I'm guessing that we should be able to do it. Well, the book which did more than any other single thing to lead to the Civil War was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin is a novel. And in the novel, Eliza escapes the slave trader by going across an ice-filled Ohio River. Now, you could imagine the critics of that generation saying, the total number of slaves who actually cross the Ohio when it's icy is so small that this is a misrepresentation. But it's an emotionally, unbelievably powerful scene. And when Lincoln met <clears throat> Harriet Beecher Stowe, who'd written the book, who was very short, and Lincoln, of course, was very tall, he apparently looked down at her and said, I understand you're the little lady who started the war. And the, the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin on Northern thinking about slavery was so profound. Well, I would suggest to you, if you see Sound of Freedom, it's pretty hard not to be really upset that children that young, four, five, six years old, are being sold into slavery. And the movie ends with a, with a line, that's, uh, which is accurate, which says there are more people today in slavery than at any time in human history. And my wife, when she was the ambassador of the Vatican, was very involved in this and, 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 and went to refugee camps and talked to people who had been sold into slavery. And it's, it's, it's staggering how common it is, including in the United States. So I don't know if that helped you at all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you.
you all very, very much.